First episode of No Eye Contact. Yes, thank you. Welcome. My name is Ash. I'm 26. I'm a Virgo. And I'm just going to jump right into it, okay? It's Aquarius season. It is Aquarius season. And I don't know about you, but I like zodiacs. I think they're fun. Um, a friend recently said and I really like this look he's like half of it half of me is like this is ridiculous but then the other half of me is like too much of this shit lines up and I like that I like that open-mindedness but so um you know I think the zodiacs are fun and I have been wanting to learn more about the zodiacs And so I thought, you know, why not um, turn it into a podcast episode? Fuck it. Because then it forces me to like actually learn about the Zodiacs. Also, I learned because I didn't know. I didn't know that the Zodiacs were connected to Greek mythology. And I have recently, probably in the past year, gotten really into Greek mythology. And so that made me more excited to learn about the Zodiacs because I think that's fucking sick as fuck. Um. I actually, I read, I'm going to be reading things from this book, but so this is a giant fucking book by Stephen Fry called Mythos, the Greek Myths Reimagined. It took me literally a year to read the whole thing. Um, It's cool because it's, he doesn't, he doesn't write in a way that's like, he's not like this happened and then this happened and then this happened. He like tries to make it a, a narrative kind of like. He kind of gives everyone personalities and like makes them say sassy things to each other and shit, which you'll see some of that when I read pieces. But so probably as I do episodes on the Zodiacs and I would like to do them like when it comes time to their season. Season? Aquarius season? I guess it's a season. Their fucking time frame. Anyways, so... Yeah, I'll be I'll be referencing this. Also, if you like Greek mythology and you like reading, I would like to recommend uh, Madeline Miller. She wrote two books. I accidentally read her second one first, but it doesn't really matter. They're both really good. She is a ancient Greek teacher. She's been teaching it for like 10 years. And so her first book is called The Song of Achilles. It's about like Achilles life and you can just you can tell that this bitch was has been she knows her shit okay and you can fucking tell but she's also like such a good writer and really like sucks you in and like sometimes Greek mythology can get to be a lot because there's a lot of different characters with crazy fucking names and uh so it can it can be like a lot but I feel like she does it in a way where it's not like overwhelming And she does a good job of tying other, like, Greek myths into her story, which is really fucking cool. Her second book, which is the first one I read, I think I like it a little bit better than Song of Achilles. It's called Circe. I hope that's how you say it. And it's about kind of like this sea nymph, witch goddess in in Greek mythology who got banned to an island and like Odysseus comes to the island like a bunch of fucking shit happens it's so fucking good I think I like it a little better because like women you know so anyways it's fucking Aquarius season bitch I have three Aquarii Aquarius in my life one is my father we won't talk about that one (laughs) the other two are my friends Mads and Jackson and they are the sweetest little fucking beans. And when I read stuff about Aquarius, they really, they really are Aquari- Aquarius. <laughs> Aqu- Aquari. Aquari. 
Aquarius. Hmm. Anyways, let's just get right fucking into it, okay? Aquarius. Aquarius. Aquarius is the 11th zodiac sign. It is an air sign, which I was like, what the... F-? I know that it's like earth, air, fire, water. But like, what does that mean for your sign? So here's like a quote about being an air sign. This is the element that connects all other elements. Even though it might seem less... Re- relevant invisible as it is the distance from the nature of earth lifts us up high in impractical and mental planes that don't satisfy our physical needs still this is the element that can be found in all others keeps the fire going just like the sun burns hydrogen we may say that the beginning of life wouldn't be possible without fire but there would be no fire on our planet without air the element of air gives us room to breathe widens our lungs and with them opens our soul to personal freedom all signs that belong to this element have a strong need to feel liberated and free and the other two signs that are air signs are um, Libra and Gemini. So Aquarius, Aquarius, Libra, and Gemini. But so it's the 11th zodiac sign. It's between Capricorn and Pisces. And it's from January 20th to February 18th. Although I've seen, as I was doing my research, I saw a couple of different dates for the February one. It was like sometimes the 18th, sometimes the 20th. So... But I saw February 18th the most. It is the Aquarius sign logo thing icon is the water bearer. And it's like a little person dumping out a little vase of water and the water is flowing. Which honestly to me, it's very misleading that Aquarius literally like aqua, aqua in the name and the actual sign is like water spilling out of a jug, but it's an air sign. Like, I'm doing the math, and it's like, it's just not adding up. I don't understand. It represents the, quote, stable, snowy, and cold part of winter before there is any sign of spring. It is ruled by the planet Uranus, which we will get into that in one second. And it is, quote, a sign of new beginning. So, Uranus the planet, it was the... So sorry, with the signs, I'm going to be getting into like kind of like this, the, the, the space shit, the Greek mythology shit, and then like the actual like sign characteristics. So let's do some space shit. All right. So Uranus was the first planet discovered after the invention of the telescope. And they actually didn't know it was a planet for a while because it's, It's not super bright, like it has low luminosity. And so they just kept thinking it was a star. And then, but then they realized like, oh, it's fucking huge. And it has like 27 moons. And yeah, this is a fucking planet. So uh, it wrote, it actually rotates in the opposite direction of the other planets besides Venus. So both Venus and Uranus like rotate opposite from everyone else. And this is a quote, this seems to be truly significant to understand its nature of opposition, spite, and eccentricity. Um, It is an ice giant with the lowest temperatures in the entire solar system. It is considered, quote, the planet of originality, innovation, and expanded consciousness. And it is the only planet to take its name from Greek mythology. And it's from Uranus, which is, but it's spelled O-U-R-A-N-O-S, Uranus, and he is the sky father, like the personification of heaven. And so I'm basically about to give you like a, a crash course on the, like the beginning of Greek mythology. This is like Greek mythology's version of the Bibles, you know, in the beginning, God, there was nothing. And then God created light and God created dark and then God created this. And then he fucking jerked off and like some deer came out. <clears throat> so this is their version of that. So let me get my book and I'm just going to read a few things from the book. But so basically at the beginning, so like, like science accepts, you know, the big bang theory, like there was nothing. And then there was, or they can only assume there's nothing because they can't go back further than the Big Bang Theory. And then there was a Big Bang. And then everything kind of spiraled from that. But so with Greek mythology, it's not considered the Big Bang. It's just called chaos. 
And so I'm going to read a piece of this. <clears throat> they said that it all started not with a bang, but with chaos. Was chaos a god, a divine being, or simply a state of nothingness? Or was chaos just as we would use the word today, a kind of terrible mess like a teenager's bedroom, only worse? Think of chaos perhaps as a kind of grand cosmic yawn. Whether chaos brought life and substance out of nothing, or whether chaos yawned life or dreamed it up or conjured it up in some other way, I don't know. I wasn't there, nor were you. And yet, in a way, we were, because all the, all the bits that make us were there. It is enough to say that the Greeks thought it was chaos who, with a massive heave or a great shrug or hiccup, vomit, or cough, began the long chain of creation that has ended with pelicans and pen penicillin and toadstools and toads, sea lions, seals, lions, human beings, and daffodils, and murder, and art, and love, and confusion, and death, and madness, and biscuits." Whatever the truth, science today agrees that everything is destined to return to chaos. It calls this inevitable fate entropy, part of the great cycle from chaos to order and back again to chaos. So the chaos that began everything is also the chaos that will end everything. So first there was chaos and then chaos birthed or made or created the first order. And the first order was... Erebus, which is darkness, and Nyx, which is night. And then they coupled up, Erebus and Nyx, and they made Himera, which is day, and Aether, which is light, or maybe ether, light. Um, Chaos also brought forth Gaia, which is the earth. Gaia is considered Mother Earth. And then also made Tartarus, who is the caves and the depths underneath the earth. And they were not gods and they weren't personalities. And let me actually read this part. <clears throat> what first emerged from chaos were primal elemental principles that were devoid of any real color, character, or interest. These were the primordial deities, the first order of divine beings from whom all the gods, heroes, and monsters of Greek myth spring. They brooded over and lay beneath everything, waiting. So then Gaia has two sons. She has Pontus, which is the sea, and then she also has Uranus, which is the sky. And this is about Uranus. Uranus, who preferred to pronounce himself Uranus, Uranus, was the sky and the heavens in a way that at the very beginning, the primordial deity, deity, the primordial deities always were the things they represented and ruled over. You could say that Gaia was the earth of hills, valleys, caves, and mountains, yet capable of gathering herself into a form that could walk and talk. The clouds of Uranus, the sky rolled and seethed above her, but they too could coalesce into a shape we might recognize. It was so early on that the life of every it was so early on in the life of everything, very little was settled. So then comes the second order. Uranus the sky covered his mother Gaia the earth everywhere. He covered Gaia in both senses. He covered her as the sky still covers the earth to this day, and he covered her as a stallion covers a mare. When he did so, something remarkable happened. Time began. Something else began too. What shall we call it? Personality? Drama? Individu individuality? Character with all its flaws and failings, fashions and passions, schemes and dreams? Meaning began, you might say. The seeding of Gaia gave us meaning, a germination of thought into shape. Seminal semantic semiology from the semen of the sky. I will leave such speculations to those better qualified, but it was nevertheless a great moment. In the creation of and conjuring with Uranus, her son and now her husband, Gaia unwound the ribbon of life that runs all the way to human history and our very own selves, yours and mine. So she fucked her son, which also that, Incest is not weird in Greek mythology. So, <clears throat> but so they had 12 healthy children and this was the second divine order and uh, known as the Titans. So this is before the gods and stuff. After the Titans, Gaia and Uranus had more kids they had two sets of triplets the first set of triplets were cyclops and they were thunder lightning and brightness 
And then the second set of triplets was um, really ugly and scary. They were called the... How do I say this word? Hecatonchires. Hecatonchires. I'm going to call them the Hecas. The Hecatons. Hecatons. So the Hecatons had 50 heads each and they had 100 hands each and they were described as hideous, fierce, violent, and powerful as anything that had yet been released into being. Gaia loved them because she's a mom and they're her kids. But Uranus was like, you bitches are disgusting. And then maybe he was also a little bit scared of them. But so he was, he just straight up pushed them back into Gaia's womb. And this book says, we have good cause to wonder here what he pushed them into Gaia's womb really means. Some people have taken it to indicate that he buried the Hecatons and the Cyclops in the earth. Divine identity at this early time was fluid. How much of a god was a person and how much an attribute is hard to determine. There were no capital letters then. Gaia the Earth Mother was the same as Gaia the Earth itself, just as Uranus the Sky and Uranus the Sky Father were one and the same. What is certain is that in reacting like this to the three Hecatons and the three Cyclops, his own children, and in treating his wife with such abominable cruelty, Uranus was committing the first crime, an elemental crime that would not go unpunished. So basically now Gaia is in a lot of fucking pain. Like the Cyclops and the Hecatons with like their 50 heads and 100 hands are like freaking the fuck out inside of her. And like she's in pain. And not only is she in pain, but now she's like pissed and fucking hates Uranus. And so she decides he's got to go. He's fucking annoying and he's got to go. So she spends 12 days and 12 nights fashioning a weapon. She makes a sickle and it is described as, and it's described as an enormous scythe whose great curved blade had been forged from adamantine, which means untamable, a massive aggregate of gray flint, granite, diamond, and ophiolite. It's half moon blade half moon blade had been refined to the sharpest edge an edge that could cut through anything so then after she makes this weapon she hides it in a mountain and she starts going around and visiting all 12 of her kids to be like hey do you want to kill your dad and rule the world with me the quote is Will you kill your father, Uranus, and rule the cosmos with me? You will inherit the sky from him, and together all of creation will be our domination. And so as she goes around, like, all of her kids are kind of doing their own thing. They've all coupled up, and they've, like, made a bunch of fucking babies, and they're just, like, way more interested in just doing their own shit. They're like, it doesn't really serve me to kill Sky Daddy. Plus, I don't even know if we can kill him. So... I'm good. See you later. And then uh, she finally gets to the very, very last kid. And that is Kronos, who is arguably the most famous Titan. Probably for this reason. So luckily, Kronos fucking hates his dad. He's like a little emo kid. And he's like, so when she's like, hey, you want to you kill him? She, he's like, uh, yeah, I can be persuaded. And so she's like walking him to the mountain and the whole time she's like in his ear being like, oh, he's just so scary. Like, I'm scared for you guys. Like, he just, he needs to be stopped. And then she takes him to the mountain. She gives him the sickle. And she's like, listen, dude, here's the plan. Is that I'm going to like... Basically, she's like, so at night, like your father comes and we make love. So when you you're gonna hide behind a rock and then when you hear him coming to make love to me as he is in his vulnerable state strike so that's what he does he hides and he hears urnas show up to fuck his mom slash wife and he waits until he can hear that his dad is having sexy time and he jumps out and he cuts his dad's cock and balls off of his body. Cuts his dick clean off. And just straight up 
yeets that bitch across Greece. And actually, that's where Aphrodite came from. So he throws his dick across... (laughs) He throws his dick across Greece and it lands in the ocean and it's like shooting fucking semen everywhere. And then it makes like a bunch of foam in the ocean. And the next thing you know, beauty itself, Aphrodite comes like Aphrodite apparently kind of like in Greek means from the foam. And so Aphrodite was born from that anyways. But so also, so back to, he just got his dick cut off. Like he's bleeding and like divine blood is basically magical and where divine blood falls, uh, like just shit happens. So like as he's bleeding out, like a bunch of little fucking creatures are being born, like specifically the furies, the, some nymphs and giants are born. But so, oh, and Kronos also cuts the Cyclops and the Hecatons out of his mom. Which I don't know if that was the plan. She acted pretty like offended by that. But so. Uranus. Curses. Kronos. He says Kronos. Vilest of my brood and vilest in all creation. Worst of all beings. Fouler than the ugly Cyclops and the loathsome Hecatons. With these words I curse you. May your children destroy you as you destroyed me. And this is a this is a real curse, boys and girls, and everyone in between. So, but Cronus doesn't give a fuck. Cronus is like, listen, you you have no power to curse me. I just cut your dick off, so I don't give a fuck. And uh, he Cronus locks the Cyclops and the Hecatons like in the caves under the earth, and then he takes Uranus and locks him even further as far as he fucking can from heaven so that he's like completely opposite from where he's supposed to be and locks him down there and Uranus actually like compresses all of his anger and divine energy into the rocks that are surrounding him hoping that like maybe one day some kind of creature will excavate and maybe mine the rocks for his power And that's actually where the idea and name for uranium comes from. Full circle. Full fucking circle. Because we just talked about radium girls. Yeah. Anyways. So if you don't. So I'm going to. That's all I have about Uranus slash Uranus. But if you didn't know. Kronos the Titan. So just crash course on this so he starts so now he's like now he's like i'm the fucking king of the earth gaia basically like retreats and kind of is just like i'm done running shit i'm just gonna be over i'm just gonna be the earth over here and doesn't really do much anymore but so now the titans are ruling and chronos is like the leader because he's like i cut dad's dick off like bow down to me and he starts fucking his sister <clears throat> and they he just in the back of his mind is remembering that his dad's like your kids are gonna kill you just like you fuck me and so every time his wife has a kid he fucking eats that bitch like a little jelly bean just and so he eats the first five kids and she's fucking mad her name's Rhea. she's like fucking pissed because she's like i want a goddamn baby stop eating the babies and he's like what if the curse is real i can't let these babies come to fruition So she's pregnant with her sixth baby and she, I believe calls on Uranus and Gaia for like help. And they end up like talking to her and making a plan. But so she goes and meets with like this she go and some kind of, some kind of other like fairy ass bitches. And they make a plan for here's what happens is that she finds this stone that I guess looks like a baby wraps it in a cloth she goes and pretends like she has birth she like makes all the noises and then she makes like the noise of the baby crying and then chrono shows up because he's like "Ooh, where's that sixth baby I'm hungry and he fucking snatches the rock and eats the rock not knowing he thinks it's the baby she goes to her little secret hiding place with the fairy bitches has her baby in secret and gives them her baby to raise. 
and she comes and visits the baby all that she can. This baby is Zeus. And <clears throat> so this is this has nothing to do with Aquarius. I just think it's interesting. <laughs> but so uh Zeus is raised being told like like when you're gonna you're gonna kill your father. Or maybe it's not even to kill your father. It's just like revenge i don't know he's being raised being told like your father's a piece of shit and he ate all your siblings and you you have to do something and he's being educated and shit and then when he is 17 he he gets somehow the sh the fairy bitches he's with like gives him some kind of little like potion that makes you throw up but so he come when he's 17, he goes down there and Rhea's like, Oh, Kronos, like, look at this little cupbearer boy. I got you a little cupbearer boy, and it's Zeus. And Zeus is like, Oh, here, like, have this po have this little drink, little potion. And so he drinks it, and then it's revealed that Zeus is the sixth son that he didn't eat. And then he throws up the other five kids, and that's like Poseidon, Hades, Hera. I think one's name's like Hestia or Hes yeah, Hestia. I can't think of who the fifth one is. Hades, Demeter, Poseidon, Hera. I thought he ate five. Oh, the first one was Hestia. Anyways, okay. So they all get spit up. And then Zeus cuts, I believe he cuts Kronos up into a bunch of little pieces and does something with them. And then that's when the fucking Greek gods come to power. So yeah, it's kind of cool how like Zeus, Zeus was like a big part of their everything. Like he literally saved the Greek gods, but and like he was the hero but like zeus is a piece of shit and we'll probably get into that in like later podcasts but like zeus fucking blows anyways <clears throat> so uranus uranus that's where it comes from uh so let's talk about the star constellation so it's one of the uh, this is aquarius one of the oldest constellations in the sky and many of the stars in aquarius's names uh refer to good luck the constellation looks like a vase or a cup pouring out water. Um, and it's located near the other water related constellations in the sky. I dare say the sea section of the sky, like uh, Cetus, which is the whale, Pisces, the fish, Delphius, the dolphin, and Eridanus, the river. And then here's just like some little history like before greek mythology shit but so well like the first kind of recorded account of aquarius the the constellation was in the second century by greek astronomer claudius ptolemy i don't know how to say that and the sumerians believed that when the Aquarius constellation showed up, it brought on the global flood, but in actuality, it just, when it showed up, that happened to be the time of like the flood season in the Middle East, like the rainy season. And then, uh, in ancient Egypt, they believed same thing. It was just flood season, but they believed like, Oh, when they saw this constellation, it was, um, the water bearer like dipping their jar into the Nile River and that's why the Nile River would flood. Uh, Babylonian astronomers thought that the constellations, uh, that the Aquarius constellation represented the god, I don't know how to say it, it's spelled just E-A, Ea? I'm just gonna say Ea. But so Ea is quote the great one it's a, a ruler of the southernmost quarter of the sun's path which is the period of 45 days on either side of the winter solstice and it is represented um the god is represented holding an overflowing vase so this is how it's connected to aquarius and then the the greeks just thought it was like the constellation was just a vase pouring water so here is who it's connected to in greek mythology is ganymede so Ganymede, and again, I don't know if I'm saying that right. 
Ganymede. Uh, he was like this super fucking hot Prince of Troy. Like super fucking sexy. I actually have a description of him. No more beautiful youth had ever lived and moved upon the earth than this Prince Ganymede. His hair was golden, his skin like warm honey, his lips a soft, sweet invitation to lose yourself in mad and magical kisses. Girls and women of all ages had been known to scream and even to faint when he looked at them. Men who had never in all their lives considered the appeal of their own sex found their hearts hammering, the blood surging and pounding in their ears when they caught the sight of him. Their mouths would go dry and they found themselves stammering foolish nonsense and saying anything to try to please him or attract his attention. When they got home, they wrote and instantly tore up poems that rhymed thighs with eyes, hips with lips, youth with truth, boy with joy, and desire with fire. Unlike many born with the awful privilege of beauty, Ganymede was not sulky, petulant, or spoiled. His manners were charming and unaffected. When he smiled, the smile was kind, and his amber eyes were lit with a friendly warmth. Those who knew him best said that his inner beauty matched or even exceeded his outer. So he's just like super hot, but he's like a chill dude, you know? just being a prince of troy so zeus he's he's so hot that zeus it, he catches zeus's eye and zeus is like oh my god you're so fucking sexy i have to have you so zeus turns into an eagle and swoops down and literally kidnaps Gan ganymede and takes him to mount olympus where he's like you're gonna be my cup bearer you're gonna bear my cups and also at the same time be like his minion and his lover and his companion and it's not known if ganymede returned the feelings i mean i feel like he probably wouldn't have a choice again zeus is a piece of shit but it sounds it's according to this book like all the other gods except for zeus's wife hera obviously liked him they really they liked his company and they thought he was a good person and plus, he's super hot. Why would you not? Like, let's let's have a super hot person around Mount Olympus. Why not? Uh, but so. Uh, so, yeah, he's his cup bear on Mount Olympus. And Zeus is like, you know, I kind of feel bad for stealing you from your dad. So he, like, sends a bunch of, like, divine horses to the king of Troy to be like, sorry about it. Good thing you have two more sons, right? <laughs> um, and then... This is also from the book. When the reign of the gods was coming to an end, Zeus rewarded this beautiful youth, his devoted minion, lover, and friend, by sending him up into the sky as a constellation in the most important part of the heavens, the Zodiac, where he still shines as Aquarius, the cupbearer. So Aquarius is literally Ganymede. And I read other versions where it's like, I read other versions of the myth where, uh, like, Hera was so pissed about him being the cupbearer that like she kept arguing with Zeus and then Zeus was like fine I'll just put him in the fucking stars now he's out of the way <laughs> but anyways I like that this book is it makes it sound nicer but he was the the first mortal to become immortal um and this is a quote Aquarius represents in a way the mercy of the gods in the same way Ganymede was noticed by deities because of his beauty this person could be beautiful or special in any other way enough to be supported by nature or her superiors. This is a story of one's divinity, the ability to see things from above, reach for the skies in any possible way, and share a divine message with mere mortals. In a practical sense, this sign will tell us about someone who will easily get a very good job and work in the higher structures of human, human society. The beauty of the person doesn't necessarily have to be physical, but can also be seen through a certain talent or a special ability. We can see someone young with the need to separate from an in influential father and start a career on their own. In Aquarius, we also see potential for bisexual and homosexual preferences, as well as possible benefits a person can have because of them. Both of my Aquarius friends are gay. So, but most of my friends are gay. So, <laughs> so anyways, characteristics of Aquarius. They are introverted but most eccentric and energetic they are born intellectuals and deep thinkers they love alone time and they like to enjoy their imagination they're born to be independent and unique they're the best pacifiers and moderators they can solve an issue without hurting anyone they are leaders and guiders their strengths are that they are progressive original independent and humanitarians and their weaknesses are that they run from emotional expression they're temperamental uncompromising and aloof 
And this is a quote. The air element zodiac sign is represented to hold the weight of the water to quench the thirst of the earth. That's so cute. It makes me a little bit sad because it just sounds like, like, that's a lot of shit to hold. Put it down. Take a rest. Um, so yeah, that's all I got on Aquarius. Kind of fucking cool. Little, little cup barriers. Little, bar- barriers? Cup bearers, water bearers, and yeah, um, what kind of vibe do I get from Aquarius? I get, yeah, they're just like, I feel like they're good people, 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 persons, but yeah, they do, they need their alone time to like recharge, um, and they just, you know, they want to see the good in the world. And yeah, I, th- I think all these descriptions fit my two Aquarius friends. And they're li- they're just little gay cup bearers, you know? You know how it is. Jackson and Mads, I love you guys so much. Keep doing you. And I know your guys' birthday is next week, so party fucking hard. It's Aquarius season, baby. Eh. The next sign that I'll be talking about next month is Pisces. That's exciting. But so yeah, I hope you found this interesting because I found it interesting. It's my podcast and I'm going to talk about what I think is interesting. But if you listen this far, you're fucking cool. And I appreciate you. And if you didn't listen this far, fuck you. I fucking hate you. So yeah, that's maybe this is kind of a short episode i don't know but uh yeah that's all i got hope you enjoyed it happy aquarius season and i will catch you on the fucking flip bye